I was born Leslie Jacob Wagner. I hated the name Leslie, so when I turned 18, I changed it legally, and for seven years now I have been Jacob Wagner. I was married to Laura for almost three years. Her full name was Laura Elizabeth Keys, and she could have been the twin of the famous princess. I graduated from college and worked for a cement company. The company bought new computer equipment and we held classes on it. Eight people sat in a room we had converted to a temporary classroom and waited for the instructor to show up. She walked in, introduced herself as Laura Keys, and I fell in love. I found out later that three of my fellow students were in love as well. I was the first one to approach her during lunch hour and ask her to lunch. She turned me down and everyone else who invited her. In fact, she turned all of us down in the three days she was there. On the last day of class, we each got her business card. We could call her if we had any questions or problems with the course we were taking. That was on Wednesday. I waited until the following Monday before calling her. This is Laura. I'm not available, but leave your name, number, and a short message, and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Hi, Laura. This is Jacob Wagner from the cement company you taught at last week. What problem do I have to solve to get you to go out with me? That's the kind of message I left. She called the next day. Jacob Wagner, how can I help you? I answered as my phone rang. Hi, Jacob. This is Laura. You said you had a problem. Oh, hi, Laura. Yes. I'm hungry and I hate eating alone. She laughed and it was a lovely tinkling sound. I can't dine out, but my evenings are free, she said. That's where it all started. We had dinner together the rest of the week, and on Sunday the first week and for five full weeks after that. We never had lunch because she worked out every day from 11 to 1 o'clock. She either ran, swam, or biked. Her goal was to compete in the Ironman competition. The Ironman competition consisted of a 2.4-mile swim, immediately followed by a 112-mile bike ride, and then a full 26.2-mile marathon. All three legs had to be completed in less than 17 hours. She was also vegan, so our meals consisted mostly of quinoa, kale, tofu, brown rice, oats, sweet potatoes, and beans. It took me a long time to get used to eating this way. We were married 14 months after we met. She stopped working out for the honeymoon, but immediately upon our return, she started working out. One evening she came in and I was sitting in the only chair we had in our living room. She told me that next year there was an Ironman in Wisconsin that she wanted to participate in. It will be her first race and she needs to train even harder than before, but she thinks she'll be ready by the time she gets there. I couldn't imagine anyone training even harder than her, and I didn't see any allure in turning my life upside down for such a sporting event. I assumed that all people strive to accomplish something exceptional. I loved my work and strove for excellence, albeit to a somewhat lesser degree than Laura. I was hesitant to accept her attempt because I saw her training just for the sake of training. Training for Iron Man would more than double her training time. But still, I agreed. That's when things started to change in our house. Training costs almost doubled. After about four months of extra training, she told me she needed a trainer. There was one at her gym who had competed in Iron Man and was willing to coach her. Of course, he wasn't free. His expertise cost us a lot of money. The first thing he did was convince her to quit her job so she could train full-time. She did this without talking to me. When she quit her job, our family budget immediately went down the drain. She had a very nice competition bike, but her coach told her it wasn't good enough, and we bought another. Then she needed one that she would use for competition. The other she used for training. Then he decided she needed a spare bike for competition, so we bought another one. In total, she had four bikes. Their total cost was equal to the cost of my two-year-old truck. Time was running out and I decided it was time to meet her trainer, so I headed to the gym. I knew his name was Jason Hendricks because I wrote checks every week. I saw them in the gym. He was standing over her while she was lifting weights. And he was touching her in a really weird way. And it was like she was seducing him. I watched for a couple more minutes before they moved on to another exercise. I don't know what it's called or if it has a name, but it's the one where you pull ropes away from the wall. There were weights attached to the ropes and you could add or subtract weight as you saw fit. Laura stood with her back to the wall and grasped the rope handles. Hendrix was facing her and was very close to her. I watched her pull the rope twice before I walked over to them. She pulled and her hands were right in front of her, holding the weights on the ground. Why are you playing with my wife? I asked and scared the hell out of both of them. Jacob, what are you doing here? Laura asked. 
I thought it was time I met Mr. Hendricks, I replied. He held out his hand for a handshake, but I just looked at him and ignored the hand. He was taller than me by about three inches and outweighed me by at least 30 pounds. You have no right to touch her like that. Then I won't be able to train her properly. You have to touch her breast to train her? What kind of training is that? That's exactly what I do. Then we'll find someone to train her without prying eyes. Your services are no longer required. Laura, I'll see you at home. I walked away. Jacob. Jacob. Come back, she almost shouted after me. I continued walking, got in my car, and drove home. She burst into the house right after I arrived. What the hell are you doing? she asked. You can't fire him for doing his job. Like hell I can't. I saw the whole thing. He was just assessing my pecs. I laughed out loud. Jesus, Laura. You can't honestly believe that. Evaluating your pecs, my ass. And you stood there and let him. You even smiled. He's not fired. I need him. You can't be serious? Oh, yes, I can. He's staying. I looked at her. Then you can have him, but I want no part of it. I won't pay him a dime, and if you insist on keeping him, I won't pay for the rest of your tuition either. She looked at me. Then I'll get a job, but he'll stay as my trainer. I thought for a moment before I spoke. How important is he to you? Extremely. And how important am I? You're my husband. But how important am I? I told you I don't want you to train with him, but you insist he continue. So where am I on your priority list? And where am I on your priority list if you won't let me train for what I really want to do? I understand what you want to do, and I support you. But what I don't understand is what you're allowing him to do. You're my wife, and I won't tolerate that. Find another coach because he's out. I want to do well at Wisconsin, and he can help me. She crossed her arms and looked at me defiantly. What about doing well in our marriage? Is this Iron Man more important than that? She looked at me, then turned, uncrossed her arms and started to say something, but changed her mind and went upstairs. I decided that was answer enough. I sat there dumbfounded for a few minutes. If I wasn't wrong in my guesses, she had already made up her mind, and all I had to do was come up with my own solution. I went over to the computer and took care of the money stuff that I had heard should be taken care of in case of marriage problems. I figured I'd get it done before she did. That bastard won't get a dime of my money. If she wants to keep paying him to screw her over, let her do it with her share and unmarried. We had a fifth-wheel camper that I used during the summers when I was in college. Laura and I used to drive it to the mountains so she could bike and run in the mountains. She said it was a better workout that way than on the flatlands. I went upstairs and she was in the bathroom. I could hear her talking to someone, but the only thing I could make out was, see you tomorrow. I grabbed my clothes and headed for the camper. Three more trips and I got what I wanted. On the second trip, I heard the sound of water in the bathroom and realized she would be in there for at least an hour. She loved to lounge in the tub, especially after a hard day. When most of the clothes were stowed in the RV, I loaded up the computer and other personal items. I spent the night in our office parking lot. The next morning, I brought my boss up to speed. He asked what my plans were, and I said I didn't have any yet. In the evening, I stopped by to see if I needed anything else. Laura was there eating coleslaw. I made my way to the room we used as an office and started going through folders and books. She walked in and started watching me. Where did you go last night? She asked. It was the first night we had spent apart since we had been married. I stayed at the factory. What did you do? Invited Hendricks over to evaluate your pecs? That wasn't necessary. But was it true? No. There was a long silence as she watched me put down what I wanted to take. What are you doing? She asked. Leaving. Why? Because you made it clear last night that he's more important to you than I am. I told you I want to do well at Wisconsin and I can't do it without his help. Are you telling me that no other coach can do what he does? We work well as a team. I've seen how well you work as a team. He caresses you and you smile. I told you he doesn't fondle me. 
I just shook my head. You and I used to be a good team once. We still can. Just give me that chance. You're going to give up on him as coach? She shook her head. No. Then I'm leaving. I gathered my things and headed for the door. When are you coming back? I turned to look at her. That's up to you. Tell me he's done and I'll stay. But tell me he's staying and I'll leave. Forever. I won't come back. She did not hesitate. He'll stay. What a thing to say. One of us was pretty selfish, or maybe both of us were. I wanted to have a wife and she wanted to compete. It took three trips to stow the rest of my stuff in my truck. She watched me make all three trips. On the third, she asked where I was going. I have no idea. When will you be back? She'd asked that question once before, and I figured we'd already discussed it. We've already discussed it. I don't plan on coming back. Jacob, you can't do that because of my coach. And you can't favor your coach over me, but apparently you do. I took half our money and charged you to our credit cards. Your phone should have been disconnected. I looked at my watch. About 30 minutes ago. The utility bills are due next week, as is the renter's insurance. Your car insurance is good for another four months. I recommend you get a job soon or you'll be in big financial trouble. I loaded the last load into my truck and made my way to the garage. Her bike and spare were there. They were in shipping containers that cost almost as much as the bikes themselves. I picked them up one at a time and literally threw them into my truck. She saw me and came running. What are you doing? Can't you pick them up? She yelled. Like hell I can't. I paid for them. I got in my truck and drove off. She wasn't the least bit upset about me leaving, but the thought of losing the bikes was unbearable to her. The next day was one of her mornings at the gym, and I drove by to see if she was there. I looked inside and saw her and Hendricks sitting on the bench press. She was crying and he was holding her hands. I don't know if she was crying because our marriage seemed to be over or because I had taken away her best bikes. The next day, I took the day off to find a place for my five-wheeler. I paid a month in advance and hooked up to their services. The day after that, I talked to my parents and brought them up to speed. Are you okay? Mom asked. Do you need money? Dad asked. I answered yes and no respectively. Laura and I didn't speak for two weeks. Finally, one day she called. I didn't recognize the number and didn't answer. She left a message saying she wanted to talk, so I called her. What are we going to do next? She asked. Are you still practicing with Hendrix? Yes. I need him. Then it's time for us to go to divorce court. You can't be serious. Have you had fun with him yet? How can you ask that? Easy. I've seen it all. The next logical step would be to get you into bed. So the question is logical. Again, have you had fun with him yet? She ended the conversation. The next day, my boss told me we had a job at a plant in Leadville, Colorado, if I was interested. I agreed and left for Colorado the next day. I was gone for about two months. It was already fall in Colorado, and winter was just around the corner. A little fifth-wheel trailer is not the kind of place anyone with an ounce of brains would want to spend the winter, so I rented an apartment and bought cheap used furniture to put up. I didn't know what to do with all that space after living in a fifth wheel. My parents and siblings wanted me to come home for Thanksgiving, so I went. By then, I was back to my normal eating habits. No quinoa, kale, or tofu. Not that those foods were bad, but they weren't to my taste. Spending the holiday with my family was fun. No one missed Laura. The day after Thanksgiving, I headed back to Leadville. I had lunch with my parents and was ready to leave town. I was filling up my truck with gas when an old friend saw me. We got a talking and he told me that he saw Laura and some muscular guy hanging out together. There was a little diner next to the gas station and we decided to grab a cup of coffee. Sipping it, he told me about Laura and Hendrix. They had been seen openly holding hands at the mall and walking down the street. It wasn't unusual for them to be seen kissing in public. My friend Zeke, short for Ezekiel, was talking when his phone rang. It was his brother, and they were talking about going hunting the next morning until Emmanuel, Zeke's brother, had to go to work. I let Zeke know it was time for me to leave, but he held up his hand for me to wait. Um, 
he said. Have you by any chance seen Laura Wagner lately? A pause. Yeah, Jake's wife. Pause. You're getting on my nerves. Right now. Okay. Thanks. I'm with Jake now and we'll probably come over. Thanks, Em. What was that about? I asked. You're not going to believe this, but Laura and her boyfriend have checked into Em's motel. They've been there for two days. He explained what he meant. They're not there right now. The motel isn't the best, so it doesn't have a restaurant. M thinks they left for dinner, so they'll probably be back soon. Probably at the gym, I thought. We dragged ourselves to the motel. Zeke in his car and me in mine. I parked in the farthest corner of the parking lot. I knew M, so he had no problem helping us out. By the way, none of our cameras are working, he said. Even the outside cameras are broken, so you don't have to worry about being recorded. He grinned when he said that. Why do you work at a place like this? I asked him. I own the place and make more money a month than the Hampton Inn. Laura and her boyfriend, by the way, his name is Jason Hendricks, come here at least one night a week. He's married, so they can't go to his house, and she lives with her parents since she got kicked out of your old house, Jake. Jake? Jacob and Jason. She must like guys with J names. Anyway, they come in here and do their thing. They've been here for two days because his wife spent Thanksgiving with her family in North Carolina or somewhere. I heard them joking that he didn't go with his wife. They come here because he's hesitant to take her to his house. Too many nosy neighbors. Tomorrow they'll leave because his wife will be back. Give us the key to their room, Em. We'll get it back now, Zeke said to his brother. Em, without thinking, held out the key. The motel still had room keys, not those little cards. Zeke and I went to their room. It was obvious what was going on there. Okay, Jake, that's on you. I'll take pictures outside and you take pictures inside. Are you sure M won't get in trouble? I asked. He told you he owns the establishment. He doesn't allow prostitutes and yet he makes tons of money. If he told everything he knows about the many people who spend hours here several times a week, there would be scandals by now. The police don't even respond to calls about this place. Now mind your own business and I'll mind mine. Their room was in the back of the motel, on the second floor, overlooking the construction site. It had a very small balcony, and I made sure the balcony door was unlocked and not working. I went out, went downstairs, and asked M for a ladder. He told me where his tool shed was and asked me to help myself. Several ladders were hanging outside the shed. I took an extension ladder that seemed long enough to reach the second floor and tried it. It worked, and I went to my truck to wait. Zeke called me about 30 minutes later and told me they had just gotten back and he was going to start taking pictures. It was already completely dark. I looked up, waited for the lights to come on in their room, got out of the truck, walked over and climbed the stairs. They made no attempt to close the curtain as I stood on the stairs, snapping pictures of them carelessly stepping out of their gym clothes. On the rare occasions when they looked toward the balcony, I just ducked my head so they wouldn't see me. Laura would never do this without showering first, so they went straight to the shower. They left the bathroom door open, but that was okay. The shower was a combination tub and shower built into the wall, so they couldn't leave the bathroom while they were in the tub or shower. I went to work. I had two overnight bags and stuffed all their clothes in them. All of them. There were a few things hanging on a rack on the wall outside the bathroom door, and I took those too. I threw it all out the window. To make sure I had everything, I even peeked into the bathroom looking for shorts or a t-shirt that might have been there. There were none. I even crawled on my stomach into the bathroom and grabbed every towel and tissue I could reach. I even took the bath mat. I could hear them talking in the shower, but I didn't understand anything. I knew they couldn't see me because the curtain was in the way. All the stuff, including the bedding, was thrown over to the balcony. I went downstairs and carried everything to my truck. The people in the room directly below Laura's room were watching me. I looked at them, tapped the ring finger of my left hand, pointed to the room above them, pointed to my heart. I clasped my hands together, put them together and made a gesture as if my heart was broken. The man brought his thumb and index finger to his mouth, twirled them and made a throwing motion as if to close his lips and throw away the key, which meant they wouldn't say anything. Most likely one or both of them were cheating on their spouse, so there was no way they would talk. I met Zeke and M at the front desk. I gave M the bedding I had brought with me. The brothers looked at each other and started laughing. 
M had already printed out copies of the picture Zeke had taken. We knew we were running out of time. M was just starting to print my pictures when the front desk phone rang. He looked to see which room the call was coming from and winked at us. Front desk. A pause. Really? Pause. You say the stairs are still there? Pause. Well, stay where you are. I'll send extra towels and linens. I can't do anything about your clothes and personal belongings, but I'll call the police. They'll be here shortly. A pause. No police? But I have to because someone stole your clothes. Pause. Well, if you insist, I won't call them, but all I can do is offer some towels. Pause. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir, and other than that little problem, I hope you enjoyed your stay here. He returned the tube to the stand, and all three of us started laughing. Staying where you are? That's the funniest thing I've heard in years, I said. While we were still laughing, I asked Em if I could take them new towels and linens. That set off another round of laughter. If that's what you really want, he said. He walked away and brought back a stack of things. I took them and went upstairs. I knocked on their door. Room service, I called out, the door ajar. I'll take them, Hendrick said. I ignored him and pushed him aside, muscles and all. She looked at me, shrieked, took one of the new sheets and covered herself. Meanwhile, Hendrick stood in the middle of the room, not knowing whether to shit himself or go blind. I looked at Laura. You clearly haven't evaluated his chest, Laura. He needs help. She finally found her non-shouting voice. What? How? Why? Don't try, Laura. It won't make any difference. I'll be in town long enough to file for divorce. Good luck in Wisconsin. Jacob. Jacob. Please. I didn't bother closing the door as I left. Hendrix didn't move the entire time I was in the room. She had been trying to call me and had left several messages. I had both her phone and his, so she had to use the motel phone. The gist of her messages was that I had dumped her, and she needed him for support first in the learning process and then for emotional support after I left. I decided to stay in town late to start the divorce proceedings. It took two days. Going through the clothes I had taken from their room, I found Hendrix's wallet, keys, phone, and a variety of other items. Among them was a small black notebook. It was full of addresses, names, phone numbers, and genders. Laura was rated a 6 on a 10-point scale. M later told me that a couple hours after I left, a man brought some things for them, presumably clothes. When they checked out the next morning, they were both wearing ill-fitting sportswear. The man must have brought Hendrix's car key as well. On the morning of that day when I traveled back to Leadville, I went into the Hendrix house. Mrs. Hendrix was there. I gave her his clothes and other personal belongings and copies of the picture Zeke and I had taken. The picture of Zeke showed them walking into the motel hand in hand. There were no explicit pictures, but it didn't take a fertile imagination to realize what was going on. She was also interested in his little black book. At the last minute, I handed her Laura's shit as well. Maybe you could call her and ask her if she wants those things back, I told her, laughing. It had been about two hours since I'd parted ways with Mrs. Hendricks, and I was driving down the highway on my way to Leadville when the phone rang. Hello? Jacob, I'm so sorry, but you broke up with me. Let's meet up and talk about it. Oh, and bring my bikes when you get here. She really missed her bikes. It was a real bummer because I'd already sold them in Leadville. Screw you, and I hung up the phone. My immediate boss, who was also the plant manager, was having a Christmas party and the whole plant was invited. I knew the difference between gin and bourbon, so I volunteered to serve the bar. The party was held at his house, and the bar was better staffed than some legit bars I'd seen. It was about 8 o'clock at night and the place was already buzzing. I was only taking a break to go to the bathhouse, but I was having as much fun as everyone else in the place. One of the guests brought me a plate of food and set it on the bar. You need to take a break and eat, she said. She had already stopped by the bar several times during the evening, and we chatted for a while. Thanks, I said. She sat down on one of the stools at the small bar. The other 40 or so guests were scattered around the huge basement. Many of them were sitting around the fireplace laughing or telling jokes. Others were dancing. The woman who brought me the food and I were the only ones doing nothing. Or rather, we were busy. I was eating and she was watching me. My name is Diana, by the way. Diana Webster, she said. 
I've been watching you and you don't seem to mind missing most of the party. I wiped my hands on a tea towel and held out my right one for a shake. Jacob Wagner, I said, and I bet I have more fun than most of these people. You never know what some people say to their bartender. I laughed when I said that. She laughed too. I take it you work in a factory, she said. Yes. Do you? No, I don't. I'm an accountant, but I'm also a neighbor, so they invite me to all their parties. Are there a lot of them? Not very many. Three or four a year, but they're usually good ones and some of them can be pretty rowdy. And this one? No. They're quiet at Christmas, but the 4th of July parties go wild. I haven't worked for him long, but he seems like a nice guy, I told her. Oh, he is. He and Amber are awesome, and I love them to death. I still had food on my plate, and someone wanted to order drinks for their group, so Diane took care of it. Thanks, I said. You know your way around a bar. She laughed. I uncorked a few bottles. Our host and hostess for the evening were Jonathan and Amber Whitmore. I loved working with and for him. He knew all about the plant where we made cement, the mine where we blasted, the quarry where we extracted most of the stone, and the transportation system that included both railroad and trucks. I was fortunate that he took me under his wing as soon as we met. I became his assistant, and it was a role that appealed to me. Shortly after I was done with the plate of food Diane had brought me, I was relieved of my bartending duties by another guest. Take a break and dance with this lovely lady, he said, pointing to Diana. I handed him my bar towel, stepped out from behind the bar, and bowed to Diana, who curtsied back. We both laughed and walked to the small dance floor. Our bodies immediately drew closer together and stayed that way for three songs. At the end of the third song, we stopped and looked at each other. In the interest of full disclosure, I have to tell you I'm married, I said, and she took a step back. Is she here tonight? No, and it's a long story, but I can tell it real quick. Good. I'd like to hear it, she said. We both got our drinks and she led me upstairs to the living room. She sat down on the couch and indicated for me to sit next to her. Okay, tell me about this marriage. I narrated. When I got to the sentence about stealing their clothes, she almost fell to the floor with laughter. When she finally stopped, she asked, So when's the divorce? I filed after Thanksgiving, so it'll take a few months. I took a sip of my drink. What's your story? About the same as yours, except my husband didn't need a coach for sports. He already knew how to do it, and regularly practiced with the waitresses at some of the local bars. I never caught him, but it's a small town and someone snitched on him. That was a little over a year ago. How is divorce living for you? I asked. It's still new. We've only been divorced for five months. The problem is that all sorts of creeps think that because I'm divorced, I'm easy. I laughed. I had a feeling she wasn't to be trifled with. We sat and talked until Amber Whitmore told us it was time to go home. I walked her to the house next door and we shook hands for the night. Two days later, I walked into my boss's office and bluntly asked him for Diane's phone number. I'm not authorized to give it to you without her permission, but I'll give her your number and she can do whatever she wants with it, if that's okay with you. I was fine with that. She called three days later. We talked for a long time and ended up giving me her number. After that, we talked to each other often. Our first date was two days before Christmas. We had dinner, danced a little, and I drove her home. She was spending Christmas with her family. I spent it at my apartment. Around half past five on Christmas Eve, my doorbell rang. It was Diane. Would you like some company? She asked. Sure, I replied as she walked in with a small basket. She set it on the table and started pulling out food. Turkey, ham, potatoes, all the usual Christmas dinner stuff. I told my folks that you must be alone and starving, so Mom made all this for you. Thank her for me. It looks very appetizing. She set a plate for both of us and we sat and ate, talking the whole time. Afterward, we shared our cleaning experience. Later, we sat on my couch with eggnog and still talked. I learned that her husband works at the best hardware store in town. When she told me his name, I recognized him. I made it a habit to deal with him whenever I went into that store. I liked him. They had been married three years when they divorced. 
I told her I thought he was a nice guy. Yes, he is. We're still friends, but he's a cheater and I can't stand cheaters. Let me ask you a personal question. If it's none of my business, tell me. I sighed. Your ex-husband works at a hardware store and you're an accountant. How can you afford to live next door to the Whitmores? She chuckled. Thanks to my parents, or rather my grandparents. They owned the land on which this neighborhood was built. My house was the first one built there, and they used it as a model for the others. When all the lots were sold and all the houses were built, they gave it to me. Nice grandparents. Where do they live? They have a small ranch in the Texas Highlands. They came to my parents' house for Christmas. As a matter of fact, I just left them. It was past midnight when she decided to leave. I walked her to her car and discovered about four inches of new snow. I wasn't used to snow and was concerned that she would drive in it. Of course, she'd been driving on it all her life, and this was the first time I'd encountered it in the winter. It's no big deal, she said as we brushed most of the snow off her car. The snow plows don't come out until there's about six inches left on the ground. I'll be fine. She put her hand on my shoulder, pulled me to her, and kissed me. Merry Christmas, and I'll call you when I get home if that's what you want. I want you to call, I said, and kissed her back. That was basically our second date and first kiss. Our third date was on New Year's Eve, and we went to a party at her parents' house. She introduced me to her parents, brother, sister, and their spouses. The party was crowded, and we didn't have time to chat, so I grabbed a drink and socialized. Her grandparents were back in Texas, but there were about 50 other people there, including my boss and his wife. Well, Jacob, he said, you must be doing something right. Being invited to this party is something special. I think so too, Mr. Whitmore. It's Jonathan when we're away from the factory, he said. His wife said, and Amber is whenever you see me. During the party, I hardly saw Diane. She was busy helping her parents, and every time I tried to help, I was told to enjoy the party. I did, thanks to the Whitmores. They introduced me to several couples who, as it turned out, were practically the driving force of the community. One young woman became attached to me and took personal responsibility for making sure I had something to eat and drink. She introduced herself as Rosita Cameron. After about an hour, I grew bored with her and began to look for a way to escape her clutches. I tried socializing with the Whitmores and others, but I couldn't get rid of Rosie as she told me to call her. I managed to get away from her while I went to the bathroom, but she must have been waiting for me to come out, because she grabbed my hand and held it tight. Finally, I had had enough and told her I had to leave. I looked for Diane but couldn't find her, so I went over to her mother, thanked her, and said goodnight. I picked up my coat and left. The next morning when the phone rang, I was already making sausages and drinking my second cup of coffee. I looked to see who it was and answered, Happy New Year. How was the party? It was fine until Mom told me you left. Then I got upset and the party got ruined. Why did you leave and why didn't you tell me you were leaving? The main reason was a girl named Rosita. She clung to me and wouldn't let go. And every time I saw you, you were busy serving drinks, holding trays of food, or otherwise playing the perfect hostess. I looked for you when I left, but I couldn't find you, and Rosita was clinging to my arm as hard as she could. I decided to leave to get away from her. I felt her attitude soften a little. Gee, she's a good friend of mine, and I told her to make sure no woman gets too close to you. She certainly did her job. Nothing could come close to me. But I didn't want her to push you away. Anyway, Happy New Year, I said. I wish you a Happy New Year too, but he'd be happier if you were around. I'm making breakfast if you want to join me, I told her. I'd love to, but I have to watch the Rose Parade with my family. We chatted some more and made plans to meet for dinner three days later. The day before the date, I called to make sure she could make it. I'm sorry, Jacob, but something came up. She didn't offer another day. I was coming home that evening and remembered I needed epoxy to fix a lamp I had broken, so I stopped by the hardware store. My old friend David Webster, Diane's ex, was talking to another customer. Yeah, she's coming around. Two or three more dates and we'll be back together. I was stupid the first time, and she didn't deserve for me to cheat on her. But I've learned my lesson. After dinner tomorrow night, I'll feel better. We'll see. Good luck. Let me know how it turns out.
Sure, I'll let you know, David said. He turned and saw me. Hey, Jacob. What can I do for you? I need some epoxy. A small one. Not the giant economy size. I don't use that much in ten years. He laughed. I don't see why we even need a large size. We hardly ever sell them. We walked up to the register and he counted the proceeds. I handed him a twenty. I couldn't keep my mouth shut. I heard you talking about dinner tomorrow night. Trying to patch things up with an old friend? Hell no. Trying to get back together with my ex-wife. I screwed up the first time and I'm trying to make up for it. Tomorrow is my birthday and I talked her into having dinner with me. She always gave me a special birthday present, if you know what I mean. He laughed. I didn't. How does she feel about getting back together? I asked. I'm not sure. We're friendly enough. We go out to dinner sometimes and have nice evenings, if you know what I mean. It was the second time he'd used the phrase, if you know what I mean, and the implication was clear. Yeah, I think I know what you mean. I picked up my change and epoxy and went home. Two days later, after dinner with her ex-husband's birthday boy, she called me. How are you doing? She asked. Not bad. How about you? Pretty good, actually, she replied. I guess your date with David went well, huh? Yes. Wait. How did you find out about it, and how did you know it was with him? It doesn't matter. What's important is that you're dating him again? He seems to think you are. In fact, he thinks a couple more nice evenings with you will do it. How about this, Diane? Would a couple more pleasant evenings be enough? And what exactly is a nice evening in your definition of a nice evening? Dinner? Dancing? Drinks? A slow roll in the hay to give him a nice birthday present? My understanding is that you've always given him nice birthday presents. I also understand that sex with your ex must be really good. Jacob, it's not like that. How exactly? We're just talking. Yes. Pillow talk is always nice. A long pause followed before I heard it. Goodbye, Jacob. I looked at the dead cell phone in my hand and said quietly, not addressing anyone. Goodbye, Diane. The next two weeks at work were a saving grace. Our equipment was breaking down, we were behind in production, and we had a labor shortage. All in all, it was a heck of a two weeks, but I was busier than a cat shoveling shit, so the time flew by. It was the last work day of the month, and Jonathan and I decided to have lunch together. We took our seats, placed our order, and sipped our coffee. What's up with you and Diana? he asked. She talks to Amber all the time, and we were under the impression that things were going well. Then Amber told me that you accused Diane of sleeping with David. Of course, you don't have to tell me about your personal life, but... I took a sip of coffee. Well, you see, the thing is... I brought him up to speed. So you didn't directly accuse her of sleeping with him, you only hinted at it. That's right. Just like Webster hinted to me. The problem is she didn't deny it. That's too bad. He broke her heart once and he'll do it again. She's a big girl. She'll get over it, I told him. I hope so, Jonathan said. The rest of our lunch went into business. He wanted me to go down to Atlanta in a couple weeks and try to convince our headquarters to give us two more trucks for the quarry. This would be my first trip to headquarters and I was excited about it. Denver is called the Mile High City, but Leadville is almost two miles high and I would be glad to get away from that cold mountain for a few days. I was on my way to the Denver airport to fly to Atlanta. It had been a month since I had talked to Diane, and I had also changed hardware stores. I didn't like flying. As a matter of fact, this flight to Atlanta was only my fourth flight. I had heard that if you fly in or out of Denver in the afternoon, you can get into a very bumpy situation. This day was no exception. Right after takeoff, we were shaking for the longest 10 minutes of my life. Then I, for one, was overjoyed when this big airplane leveled out and floated into Atlanta. We got two more trucks, but I don't think it had anything to do with my pleas. They just saw that they couldn't argue with the numbers I had put together. I think they just wanted to see me beg. Jonathan advised me to stop by my parents on the way home, so I took a detour, which I did. I missed the warm weather in the deep south of America, especially in February. It was cold in Leadville, but in my hometown it was 68 degrees and sunny. 
My parents picked me up at the airport and with hugs and kisses took me to their home. We sat around and discussed the latest gossip. All except Laura, who we tried to avoid. I only received one call from my lawyer about the divorce. The only thing Laura had asked for was her two bicycles that I had sold. I decided I would call him the next day to see how things were going. After dinner, I called my friend Zeke. We met at one of our favorite establishments and ordered drinks. It turned out that Laura and Hendrix had moved into an old trailer together. The only money they had was what he could make as a coach. She still wasn't doing anything but coaching, but at least she was getting it for free. They put up flyers all over town asking for sponsorships so she could come to Wisconsin in April for her Ironman. They were even on two local TV shows begging for money, but Zeke, M, and a few other friends of mine made it clear that she was married, cheated on her husband, and was living with her coach while remaining married to me. Hendrix's wife joined them in condemning the couple and even went on TV to tell the story of how she ended up at their motel property. She never gave the name of the man who gave her their belongings. M's motel even got in on the action, and the unsolicited publicity started bringing in more customers. The result? Laura had only one sponsor, and that was the gym where she worked out. She received very few donations, and those were small. At least that's what I was told. Of course, no one but Laura and Hendrix knew that for sure. There were also rumors that she got pregnant, but had an abortion because she didn't want anything to interfere with her training. But those were just rumors as far as anyone knew. I called my attorney the next day, and he told me basically the same thing I had heard the night before. He also told me that our court hearing would probably be in April, and asked if I would be there. Probably not, I told him. That's okay. I'll be fine, he said. The next morning I flew to Denver. Morning flights to or from Denver are much better than afternoon flights, according to experienced pilots. This morning was perfect. Not a single bump in the sky. I picked up my truck and drove home. When I got home, it was clear and sunny, but colder than the witch's house. It was too late to check in at the office, so I headed home. I actually stopped by the best restaurant in town. I intended to have dinner, but when I went inside and looked for a free seat, I saw Diana sitting with a man. His back was to me, so I couldn't see who it was. I decided it was David. Our eyes met for a moment, after which I turned and walked away. In my apartment. I made a dinner of meatloaf and opened a beer. As I climbed into bed, I heard the wind blowing. Wind in the mountains is something. 70 miles per hour through the peaks was not unusual, and any snow on the ground was blowing like crazy. My last thought before bed was how nice it would be to have someone to cuddle with. When I got out of bed the next morning, my apartment was warm. Of course, outside, all the windows were covered in ice. I hoped I wouldn't have to go to the quarry that day. Later that afternoon in Jonathan's office, I told him about my trip. He congratulated me on acquiring two trucks. Honestly, I didn't think we'd get them, he said. You must have impressed someone. Good job. Thanks. Back in my office, I went about the work that had accumulated during my absence. That evening of the same day, I returned to the diner. Diane or no Diane, I wanted a good meal and their coffee was the best I had ever tasted. I ordered my dinner and cupped my hands around my coffee mug to warm it up. Mind if I sit down? She asked. Without looking, I asked. Aren't there any other booths around here? None. Good. If this one is so special, it's all yours. While she took off her coat, I picked up my coffee mug and coat and walked to the other end of the restaurant. When I sat down, I looked up. She was already leaving. I guess the booth wasn't that special. After that, neither the coffee nor the food tasted good to me. Have a seat, Jacob, Jonathan said. I sat down. I'm between a hammer and an anvil. A pause. We have the president of the company, two senior vice presidents and their wives coming in next week. They want to stop by here before heading to Vail to go skiing. Naturally, I want to throw a party for them, but I'm in a quandary. As my assistant, you must be invited. As a good friend of my wife, Diana must be invited. He looked at me before continuing. It would be best if you bring a date. It would also be nice to have Diana with him as well. Another pause. Are you beginning to see where I'm going with this? Yes, sir, I do. Let's see if I can help you. Invite Diane in and have her bring her ex. I understand they are close to getting back together, if they haven't already. I'll go to the quarry and repair one of the Cat 789S that will need urgent repairs by then.
I'm sure of it. Will that solve your problem? He just looked at me, smiled, and shook his head. Ever since you've been here, you've amazed me with how quickly you grasp things. When I confront you with a problem or task, you always have solid solutions and you get along with everyone. This is the first time you've made me believe that you're dumber than a truckload of our rocks at some things. The party is at my house next Friday night. Put on a suit and tie and bring a date. Now get back to work. Put on a suit and tie and bring a date. That's what he said. And he meant it. The suit and tie was no problem. But the date? The party was only ten days away, so finding a date was next to impossible. I knew only a few women in town, and none of them were close enough to ask out, especially not to the Whitmore's party. Besides, I had absolutely no idea which of those few women were single or eligible for a date. Jonathan said he was in a quandary. Apparently, he wasn't the only one. For me, the days went by too fast and I had no idea about dating. It was Saturday afternoon and I was in my apartment. I opened the refrigerator door to pull out a package of chili that I had previously taken out of the freezer to defrost. I love chili and I love cooking it. I look through cookbooks and go online to find different recipes. My last batch was especially good. I took the beer bag out of the fridge and noticed the light bulb was out and the motor wasn't running. I closed the door and reopened it several times. To no avail. I went to the panel and saw that the refrigerator switch was tripped. I reset it, but it shut off again. I tried again with the same result. The beer and chili went back in the fridge. I put on my coat and headed for the hardware store. There were two in town. I had stopped going to the one where David Webster worked, but I had to go there that time because the other one was closed. I'd never seen it closed on a Saturday afternoon, but this Saturday it was closed. Taking a deep breath, I headed to Webster's store. I knew what I needed, walked over to where it was, picked out one item and headed for the register, hoping someone other than Webster's would be there. He was, and he was talking to a man I recognized as Diane's father. I'd met him at a party at his house, but we hadn't spent much time together. I recognized him mostly by the mustache he wore. Besides his family, it was his pride and joy. He sang in a barbershop quartet, and all four singers had them. I met them at his party. I listened to their conversation. I thought I was in good shape, but she stopped talking to me, Webster said. Good for you, her father said. You don't deserve a second chance. You screwed up once, and none of us, especially Diane, think you'd do anything differently if she gave you another chance. But who is this guy she's dating? No one seems to know him, and no one has seen them together. Is he from Leadville? It's none of your business, David. Just leave her alone. All the while they were talking, finalizing the sale. After she said, just leave her alone. Diane's father took his purchase and change and walked out without looking back. Webster looked up, saw me, and smiled. It's been a while. How are you doing? Not bad, I replied. It seems like every time I come here, you talk about your love life. Do you ever talk about anything else? He laughed. It's a small town. There's not much to talk about. So how's your personal life? I asked. Last time I checked, you were working on getting your ex-wife back. It's not going very well. It seems like she met some guy and has a crush on him. The thing is, no one knows who he is and no one has seen him. I remembered seeing her at the diner with a man. Maybe he's from out of town, I said. He must be, Webster said. I finished shopping, came home, replaced the light switch, and was glad to hear my refrigerator humming again. I heated up some chili, drank two beers, stared at the snow falling outside the window, and wondered who Diane's new boyfriend was. Not that she and I were in a long-term relationship, we'd only met a few times, but I liked her. The next day was Sunday, and on this day I was doing laundry. There were only four apartments in my apartment building, and there were no laundry facilities. Every Sunday, I would take my laundry to the laundromat on Main Street, sit there, wash it, dry it, and fold it. It was always empty when I got there, and I wondered how it ever survived. One thing about Sunday drives was that I never had a problem with parking. The street was always deserted until noon, when the church service ended and people went downtown to eat at the best restaurant in town, which happened to be next door to the laundromat. It wasn't quite noon yet, and my truck was sticking out like an eyesore, as it usually did on Sunday mornings, because there were no other cars around it. I was reading the news on my phone when I heard the door open. 
I looked up and saw her. I went back to my phone. I heard her approaching footsteps and looked up again. She was sitting on the cheap plastic chair next to me. We stared at each other for a few seconds before she spoke. I wanted to leave, but I didn't want to leave my laundry behind. At least that's what I told myself, even though it was ridiculous. I think we could help each other, she began. With what? I asked. Jonathan and Amber are having a party on Friday. I know we're both invited, and I also know they'd like us both to have dates. Why don't we forget about our differences for a few days and go together? I thought for a few seconds. What about David? What about him? I thought you two were getting back together. Won't he be jealous? To be honest, he's not the kind of guy you can take to a party like this, if you know what I mean. I listened to her and suddenly I was on David's side. What do you mean? This man has been your husband for how long? Three years? I bet you went everywhere with him. He lived in the house where you live and went to the Whitmore's parties more than once. Suddenly he's not good enough? That's pretty sad. I realize he cheated on you, but the guy's trying to get you back. Maybe this party is his chance to show you that he's changed. Let me get this straight. Do you think I should go with David? I don't know, but I don't think you're going with me. She just looked at me, got up, and walked away. What an asshole, I thought. The lady made an offer to talk to you, and you, with your stupid pride, keep pushing her away. It's bloody stupid. I jumped up and went after her. Diana. Diana. Wait. She had her hand on the doorknob and was about to step out, but she stopped. I walked over to her. Well, she said. I, I, oh. Come on, Jacob. Spit it out, but it better be good. I began. I don't know what your relationship with David is like, so if I step out of line, I'm sure you'll tell me. But there you go. I took a deep breath. Laura cheated on me. David cheated on you. I have no intention of going back to Laura, and she seems quite happy with her coach, but David seems eager to get back together with you. I can understand that because after a few dates with you, I started to like you more and more. Then you and I had a date scheduled, but you canceled it, saying you had something going on. I accepted that. Then I found out you were dating your ex-husband, and I remember you telling me you were good friends. I talked to him and he said he was trying to make up with you and that you had spent some very nice evenings together. He hinted, but did not say explicitly, that these evenings included various entertainments, especially on his birthday. Then yesterday I overheard him and your father talking about your new boyfriend from out of town. Your dad told him to stay away from you. I talked to David after your father left, and I got the impression that he wouldn't give up trying to get you back, despite what your father said. So here I am. Stuck between your ex-husband, your new boyfriend, and that guy I saw you with at the restaurant, not knowing whether to get my ass in gear or scratch my watch, and you came up with the idea that we should go to a party together. I was hoping that you and I would get something out of our relationship, but I don't share and I only compete when I know the rules of the game. But there don't seem to be any rules with you, so I won't play. So here I am, not sure what to do. By then, we'd gone back to the cheap plastic chairs and sat down. She took my hands in hers. Did you really mean what you said about liking me more and more? She asked. Yes. And if there was no ex-husband or new guy from out of town, would you go to the party with me? I'd love to. What time are you picking me up? Or should I just meet you there? What do you mean? I mean that I have no intention of going back to David's place. The three nights we spent together after the divorce were all about the divorce. He tried to talk me out of paying alimony, and I wouldn't agree. I don't want his money, but I swear to God he will pay it until I get married, or if I do again. I blew off my date with you because I wanted to convince him that we were over. And I can assure you that nothing has happened between us since the divorce. I don't care what he's implying. To be honest, I'd completely forgotten that our last meeting was on his birthday, so I figured you and I would have many more evenings together. The guy you saw me with at the restaurant was my father. He and I have dinner at least once a month. As for my boyfriend from out of town, you are you. Or you're him. Or whatever the English language is. Any questions? About three dozen in all. You can start asking them tonight at dinner. In the meantime, your laundry is dry and ready to fold. 
Would half past six at my house be okay with you? That would be perfect, I said, twirling my head like a wind-up. Okay. I'll see you then. She kissed me, took two steps, walked back and kissed me again. This kiss lasted longer. I really like kissing you, she said as she walked away. I watched her walk away and marveled at the turn of events that had just occurred. I also marveled at my stupidity. Why hadn't I talked to her a month ago? Men are so damn stupid sometimes. Dinner that night was unforgettable, at least the food. The rest of it was unforgettable and almost perfect. It would have been perfect if it had ended with dancing in bed, but that didn't happen. On Thursday, Jonathan asked me if I had a date for the party. I assured him that I did. That's good because I understand Diana has one too, but I expect you both to be on your best behavior. Okay? I think we'll be fine, I said with a smile. Friday night, I parked in her driveway. There were two limousines parked on the street in front of Jonathan and Amber's house and many other cars. I rang Diane's doorbell and smiled when she opened the door. She invited me in as she pulled out her shawl. She was wearing the world-famous LBD dress that every woman on earth has and looks gorgeous in. Wow, was all I could say when I saw her. She smiled. When Jonathan opened the door for us, his eyes got big. Are you two together? At that moment, Diana leaned over and kissed me. He looked at both of us. I'll take that as a yes, he said, smiling. I was pleased when he introduced me as his assistant to the three bigwigs and their wives. The president even commented on the fact that I had sneakily swindled two new trucks from them. Yes, sir, I said, but have you seen the numbers since then? He smiled and confirmed that he had. It was a long, pleasant evening. The guests of honor got into their limousines and parted ways by midnight. Diane and I were the last ones out at two in the morning. Amber finally admitted to Jonathan that she knew about my relationship with Diana. She just wanted to watch him squirm. The four of us laughed about it. I walked Diane home. It was getting late, so we kissed goodnight at her door. She made no move to invite me in. I got a call from my lawyer informing me that the hearing for Laura and I's divorce would be held on the 7th of April. He asked if I would be there. When he asked last time, I replied that I probably wouldn't. This time I answered that I would. My relationship with Diane was getting better and better, but sex was still not happening. I wasn't making any moves in that direction, and neither was she. The day of the trial came and I sat with my attorney. Laura didn't show up, but her lawyer was in attendance. Where is she? The judge asked. In Wisconsin, her attorney replied. Why isn't she here? She's competing in an Ironman competition. What's that? Her lawyer explained. Did she decide that was more important than today? I can't answer that question, Your Honor. I think I can, said the judge. The next thing I knew, I was divorced. Laura got nothing but the money I left her. The lawyer shook my hand and told me I would be a single man in a few weeks. I spent a few days with my family, during which we heard on the local news that local resident Laura Wagner had been disqualified at the end of the swimming portion of an Ironman event in Wisconsin after she got into an argument with one of the judges over an equipment mix-up. Mrs. Wagner, who placed 1297th out of 1300, dropped her towel in the area used to transition from swimming to cycling. Her coach, Jason Hendricks, himself a one-time Ironman competitor, picked it up and handed it to her. An unidentified official immediately disqualified Mrs. Wagner, citing a rule that participants cannot be aided or assisted in any way. Mrs. Wagner became so upset that she blamed Mr. Hendricks and attacked him. She was immediately arrested and incarcerated in Wisconsin pending trial. Mr. Hendricks immediately went home, vowing that he would return for Mrs. Wagner's trial. Mrs. Wagner's bicycle was examined, and it was found that the gears were defective. Mrs. Wagner blamed this on Mr. Hendricks, who was banned for life from participating in any sanctioned competition. He was also stripped of his license to train athletes with hopes of competing at Ironman. I laughed my ass off. Almost two years of training, a divorce, an affair, rumors of an abortion, and she placed 1297th out of 1300 in her first race. She didn't need the bikes after all. When I drove there from the Denver airport, a blizzard was raging in Leadville. While I was gone, I had been in touch with Diane, so she knew about Laura's divorce and disqualification. I stopped in front of my house, grabbed my bag, and went inside. 
Just as I reached the door of my house, someone jumped on me. It was Diana. She dragged me to the front door and helped me unlock it. Then we both piled into the living room, onto the couch. Hey, 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 wait a minute. Let me catch my breath, said I. Absolutely not, mister, she said. You're divorced now. Yeah, we got into this. Around the 5th century BC, the Chinese military strategist Sun Tzu wrote a book called The Art of War. The book described aspects of warfare. At the end of a week spent with Diana, my ideas about being loved and loving changed, and I began to mentally draft an outline of the world's best book on love called The Art of Love, dedicated to her. I felt the same way about Diana. I felt when she was near me and my heart would race and a smile would appear on my face. We were married a year later. It was a beautiful day, clear, warm, mountainous, not at all like the year before. Mountain weather took some getting used to. My family came to the wedding. Just before the ceremony, my father took me aside and asked if I was interested in what happened to Laura. Not particularly, but I think you're going to tell me anyway, I told him. Well, you know what happened in Wisconsin, don't you? She attacked him? Yeah, I knew about that. She got six months in jail for it. When she got out, she came back to town, and nobody wanted anything to do with her, not even Hendrix. He worked at the same gym where they trained, but as a regular trainer. He couldn't advertise himself as an official Ironman coach. She went back to her old job because she knows a lot about computers. Anyway, she lost all interest in training, except maybe for the annual 4th of July hot dog eating contest. My God, son, she must have gained 50 pounds. I laughed. The world was in its orbit, and I was getting ready to marry the love of my life. Diane and I had seen her ex all over town, of course, but had never spoken to him. We had been married for almost a year when I had to go to the hardware store. By that time, we had one of the big home improvement stores that are all over the country. He, of course, was reselling items at our two small local stores, and they had to go out of business. Anyway, I needed new belts for my sander, so I headed to the store. I was picking out what I needed when someone tapped me on the shoulder. I turned around. It was Diane's ex, David Webster. Hello, stranger, he said. Hi, I replied. How are you doing? Not bad. He was wearing a vest with the store's name on it. Do you work here now? I asked. Yeah, it's the only game in town. The pay isn't bad and the benefits are great. Good, I said. Well, I've got everything I need, so I'll go. He touched my arm and stopped me. I want you to know you did me a favor. Did you? What kind? I don't have to pay child support anymore. I allowed that it wasn't a problem and thought to myself as I walked away. Yeah, but now I get birthday presents. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. So subscribe to my channel and watch the next video.